Well, blessings, everybody. Glad to see everybody here. Uh, let's just do a quick check right here. If you can hear me okay, can you raise your little yellow hand and wave at me? Wonderful. 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 That's great. It's good to see everybody tonight. Uh, so uh, let me pray for us because we have quite a bit to cover and uh, some wonderful, wonderful stuff this, that, that we've seen this week. And so, Father, I thank you for allowing us to come together. Lord, I thank you for, as always, for your grace and for your mercy, which we so totally don't deserve. And we just thank you for that. We praise you for it. Lord, I thank you for the time you've given us this week in your word, uh, whether it be a little bit of time or whether it be a lot of time, Lord. I know that you have spoken uh, unto each one of us and that, Lord, you are stirring within each one of us that which you are wanting us to uh, speak forth, that which you are wanting us to proclaim. And so, Lord, I just ask that you would just use this time now, that you will come and that you will give us uh, understanding. And we thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yes, Rachel, I'm talking. Can you not hear me? Let me speak with Rachel right here. Rachel's our favorite little Mariah. She lives down in New Zealand. So we'll see what's going on right here. And so uh, so how did your studying go this week in the second part of the overview of the book of Daniel? Um, tell me a couple of things that uh, sort of struck you. While we work with Rachel here. Let me see if Rachel's uh, speaker's wrong. <laughs> Whoa. <clears throat> so there we go. We'll see what's happened with that. So is there anything that y'all were struck by this week? Any questions that you have? Is that not a loaded question? <clears throat> Out of your studies this week. Well, let's back up a little bit and examine some things, and we'll see where we go. Now, let's just review what we saw last week. Uh, can you tell me real quick just the various things that we learned by going through the chapters last week in, uh, in Daniel? What's the first chapter of Daniel about? I'm sorry, would you please repeat the question? Sure. What's the first chapter what's the first chapter of Daniel <clears throat> about? I'm doing a little review from last week's lesson. Uh Daniel and his friends. Yeah, what about to obey God versus the king? Yeah, yeah. And who was king at that time? <clears throat> Neb. Neb, yes, and that, that's what I affectionately refer to him also, uh, Neb. And so Daniel and his uh, three buddies decided to do what the, what the Lord had said as far as a dietary. We'll look at that in more detail later, and rather than what the king had said. Did they have any reason maybe to hold some grudges against the king or perhaps not to do what he wanted to for some other reasons? Yeah, Colleen says yes. What were those? were being held in uh, captivity by Nebuchadnezzar. And they were being yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, if nothing else, they had been captured. They'd been hauled away from their home. And now they were being held in captivity, though a, uh, imagine a, a good captivity. You know, they're being educated. They're being fed. And yet, yeah, they were. They had been captured and hauled away from home. So good. Rachel can hear now. Good. So the second chapter of Daniel, what occurred in that chapter? Now, Aaron's telling me he can't hear. Huh.
So what happened in the second chapter? Daniel interprets um, a dream. Yeah. Daniel interprets a dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. And just roughly speaking, because we're going to go back and we're going to go into detail with all these things, obviously. But uh, how would you describe that dream? What was it about? What was going to happen to the um, King Nebuchadnezzar? Very, yeah, very good. What was going to happen to uh, King Nebuchadnezzar? What else about that dream? Yeah, Colleen, that's probably the way that I remember it, too, uh, that he had a dream of a statue, okay? And because there's several dreams and visions, and if I can narrow it down to one word, it sort of helps me remember where things are. Um, so he had a dream of a statue. Uh, Karen, you just said, uh, can you imagine telling that interpretation? Uh, what do you mean by that? Of what was going to happen to Deb. Yikes. Uh, oh. <laughs> Yikes. Oh? <laughs> Why are you laughing? Well, I just can't imagine. You know, I mean, you're standing in front of the king and you're going to tell him what's going to happen to him, right? Right, right. And it is sort of interesting because this first one right here, this first dream in Daniel 2, at least he's able to sit there and say, Thou, O Lord, thou art the head of gold, right? But when you get down to the dream that's interpreted, uh, which chapter was it? In the uh, in the fourth chapter, when Daniel looks at him and says, Oh, king, oh, that this dream was to your enemies and not to you. You know, it really shows us so much. Uh, uh, the heart of Daniel shows us the, the relationship that was developing with the king, shows us the things that were happening. Uh, <clears throat> Peggy says that she's listening, but I don't think you can hear me. Peggy, let me uh, unmute you right there, and let's try this. We tried this while I go. Peggy, uh, talk to me. Can you, hear, can you hear me now? I can hear you great. You're on the phone, right? Okay, yes. I had to call yeah. in. I couldn't figure out how to connect me other way. Okay, that's fine. No problem. Uh, yeah, uh, you were muted. I had you muted a while ago, and so okay. uh, I unmuted you right here, and that would be great unless you start talking real loud. You may, yeah, you may be sorry, and you might mute me again. <laughs> <laughs> usually, usually the reason is because of ambient sound. You know, things that are going along the background and that kind of stuff. Right. But I'll leave I'll leave you unmuted since you're on the phone. Also, a lot of times the phones. You're being, uh, hey, Aaron. Aaron. Hey, Aaron. It, okay, Aaron just muted himself. He realized that he was talking. <laughs> there we go. Great. So, uh, yeah, Peggy, a lot of times, even on uh, cell phones or on house phones, there's a way to mute the house phone. But don't worry about it. You sound great right now. So is there something you wanted to share, Peggy? Uh, no, I just earlier I was saying stuff. And, and it just, I don't just think talking just talking to yourself, to weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I do that all the time on here. I think, if, is anybody out there? Is it just me speaking out into the hinterland? But uh, so, was there anything that you remember that you wanted to share from before? Uh, no, just I was just going to answer the question that that this dream where he was interpreting, and so I'll just carry on from here. Okay, great, thank you. So, in the second chapter, he has this statue dream, and we see the God of Heaven. So, like I said, we'll see a lot more about this as we're going along. Tell me what happens in the third chapter of Daniel. Well, this is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Nebuchadnezzar is reigning. Uh, do you remember what their other names were? What their given uh, names are? Yeah. Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. Oh, man, you little Nazarene, you. Who was that that jumped in? There, he got that? it. Yeah, he got it. Yeah. He must have got an A on that test. Yeah, he probably did. You know, he's got these easy professors that give him A's. Then he finally runs into a buzzsaw along the way, you know. But, uh, yeah, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were their actual Hebraic given names, I guess. And then each one of you notice each one of these four guys was given a Babylonian name. Uh, what was Daniel's Babylonian name? Do you all remember off the top of your head? Belshazzar. Yeah, Belshazzar. And you see that mentioned a couple times. And it means something like uh, Baal he knows or something like that. It's referring to the pagan god Baal. And so, anyway... Uh, these three guys, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, would not do something. What is it that they wouldn't do? They wouldn't bow down and worship. 
Yeah, they, the they wouldn't bow down. The, yeah, the idol. Yeah, they wouldn't worship the statue of gold that Nebuchadnezzar made. Why do you think Nebuchadnezzar made a statue of gold? So people can bow down and worship. <laughs> yeah, you know, people are always saying, I wonder why he did that. Uh, the scripture doesn't tell us. I, I think that may be it, Colleen. Uh, anytime you make an idol, you know, that people bow down and worship in, in honor of you, you know, obviously it's an idol. But, I, you know, did it come because uh, Daniel had told him that you're the head of gold? You know, did it come about? He started thinking too much of himself. Well, we'll look into it more when we get there. So does the Lord deliver them? Absolutely. Well, sure. Absolutely he does, yeah. And, and just a wild way. We, and, uh, I mean, even even the smoke didn't stick to him, right? So then we get to Daniel chapter 4. What What's going on in that chapter? Colleen, <clears throat> excuse me, guys. Yeah, the tree dream. Tree dream. Yeah, I agree, Karen. The, the hair wasn't even seen. <laughs> And and what's the gist of the tree dream? <clears throat> that he was this tree. Nebuchadnezzar was this tree, but it was going to be chopped off because right now all the nations got protection under him, but he was going to be yeah. chopped off and just left the roots. Because yeah, and there were certain things. Away. Right. And then Daniel interpreted the dream. That's what I mentioned a while ago, saying, oh, man, I wish this was for some of your enemies rather than you, but here's yeah. what's going to happen. <laughs> Tell me what was going to happen to Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, he was going to be uh, chopped off, but that, that was sort of uh, symbolic of that which was going to occur. What occurred to him? He became like a beast. How, how was that described? Karen said he went mad. Karen, does it actually say he went mad? I don't think it was that exact term. Okay, so what do you mean by that? Uh, he lost all wits about him. He was down on all fours. You know, his nails grew, his beard, hair. You know, um, kind of reminds you of uh, what was that guy's name out in? Oh, the guy, the real rich guy, the um, the Getty Museum, right? Yeah, that did airplanes. Oh, you're talking about? Yeah. yeah. The guy that made the spruce goose. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, him. Yeah, was that? He lived out here, and well, he owned a lot of property out here, and he lived in El Segundo, California, for a while. Or out Howard, that way. He, Howard Hughes. And, yeah, Howard, that's it. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Just about, oh, Mac made this photo. <laughs> Oh, can I can I take a let me take ninety seconds here to tell you a funny Howard Hughes story. Are you ready for a funny Howard Hughes story? Yes. I do a local I do a, a couple of local T V programs and one of them is a live call in prayer program. And um and people call us, they call me and my wife and uh, now and at this time when people were calling it was uh, I had different other guests on with me, usually a friend and, and they call and we we speak with you for a moment and we pray for you. And so the goal is out of this twenty four minute program to be praying for you, we pray in nineteen minutes. And so uh, Aaron's been on it with me several times. So one night we get a call and I could tell that it was an older guy and he wanted us to pray for him because uh he had just found out the night before that he was the illegitimate son of Howard Hughes. And <laughs> And when you're on TV, the biggest thing is you just don't want your face and body language to betray you. It's one thing to be like we are right now. I mean, we could be sitting here doing whatever. Nobody would ever know it, right? And I'm sitting there, and I'm just going, Lord, help my face not to reflect what is going through my mind. You know, I'm just like, what in the world? And so the only thing that came out and the word that came to me was this, and this is what I said. I went, are you now? <laughs> and he went, yes. And we talked to him about a minute or a minute and a half, and it turns out, that he wanted us to pray for him. He said, I want you to pray for me. He had seen a movie the night before about Howard Hughes. Well, this gentleman's last name was Hughes, and he wanted us to pray for him because he had some really severe uh, financial problems. So he was sort of tying all this stuff together, and then he wanted us to pray for his mother, totally missing the point that how he had just referred to her, or he had just said that he was an illegitimate son. You know what I mean? Just totally missing that connection. And then he's 
And then he started talking to me about one, my youngest daughter who worked at another local TV station. He says, well, I know her. And I'm thinking, okay, this is getting a little weird, you know. I wound up talking with her later about it. It turns out that he was really uh, uh, no, no danger, no problems. He was just a little confused. But he was totally convinced after he saw that documentary and because he needed money and their last names was the same, that he was the illegitimate son of Howard Hughes. And so uh, we, we, we pray for him. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Sometimes when you deal with people, you get curious things, you know. Yeah. And so, yeah, anyway, that Nebuchadnezzar had, the, I guess, the mind of a beast, which I guess you could say would be a, a form of madness. That's the reason I sort of wanted to chase that there with you, Karen. We'll look at that more as we get to it. So tell me what happens in Daniel chapter 5, just in our uh, quick review here. Oh. This is, I thought this was very interesting that Nebuchadnezzar's son is Belshazzar versus Daniel being Belshazzar. Belshazzar, yeah. Yeah, but they had a very simple name. But this is where yeah. the writing on the wall. Mm -hmm. It's the writing on the wall. Uh, wait till we uh, get to it where you actually see sort of what the family lineage is going on right there. It gets even more curiouser and curiouser, as they say. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, when was this in the within the kingdom of Babylon? When did this take place? Uh, Daniel chapter five. Well, I think this, I mean, this had to be at the very end of his reign. Don't yeah, the last night. Yeah, or the chapter five is the last night. Yeah, so like five that, 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 Yeah, that very night. You know, so it was the last last day. So it's the handwriting on the wall, and Darius the Mede receives the kingdom. And uh, we learn some things about the Most High God, that he's sovereign. So Daniel chapter 6, uh, what did we learn from that last week? What, what goes on in that chapter? The lion's den. The lion's den, yeah. Hi. Was that Rachel? Hey, Rachel. It is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Daniel and the lion's den. And how the Lord delivers him, we'll we'll get into that later on. Can you tell me about how old Daniel was at this time? Close to seventy. Yeah, he was older. He was seventy, eighty. Yeah, uh, Aaron just sent me a private message saying "old" right there. And um, so he, yeah, That's he was older. Relative. The reason I make a big, well, yeah, no joke. <laughs> older than this. Yeah, <laughs> who said that was relative? <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I'm more in, yeah, I'm more inclined with Karen. I think he's probably 80 or more. Uh, I mean, older from the point of view. I think every picture I ever saw as a kid growing up of Daniel the Lion's Den, he was this fine, young, strapping man that had been thrown in down there. And I think they sort of missed it by 60 or 70 years, you know. Uh, so anyway, I guess I guess you know we have so much communicated to us, and sometimes we miss these truths as we're going along through the word. So this week we looked at Daniel chapter 7 uh, through 12. Uh, what's going on in chapter 7 of Daniel? Give me a, some details, some outline of what's happening here. This is the vision of the beast coming up out of the sea. So who has the vision? Daniel. Yeah, Daniel has a vision. Did you notice anything, and I might as well do this right now, because you may have noticed it, you may not have noticed it. Uh, you know, we've sort of done the overview in two parts, chapter 1 through chapter 6, and then chapter 7 through chapter 12. Did you uh, notice any type of division that occurs within the book of Daniel itself overall? Any of what they refer to in the homework as segment divisions? What did chapter 1 through chapter 6 cover, basically? How he reacted with the kings? How? That's, that's very close, yeah. How he reacted with the kings and the kingdoms, yeah. Anything else? Very good. Keep digging that. What else? It's divided into different time zones of who was reigning. Yeah, you have this sort of flowing of who was reigning. And uh, uh, keep on. You had, you had Nebuchadnezzar from 1 to 6, and then you go on into Belshazzar from 7, 8, and 9, and you go into Darius. Mm -hmm. So you see sort of a flow of a thing. Daniel said you see, uh, I mean, Aaron said you see Daniel's commitment to the Lord's steadfastness in the first six chapters, yeah. 
What else? Terry says it's more historical. Historical related to who, Terry? You're right. Yeah, what was happening to the children of Israel, uh, Aaron's saying, uh, specifically Daniel and his buddies, but uh, really emphasizing Daniel. The first six chapters of Daniel are basically uh, a history of Daniel's life. Okay? It's just sort of a chronological outline of the history of Daniel's life. Then chapters 7 and 12 pick up what? Pick up dreams and visions that he had during that time. Yes, Daniel, is, that's what Rachel said. It's the dreams and visions that he had during his life. And one thing that I, that I think is a really useful observation of this is chapters 1 through 6, Daniel is interpreting King's dreams. In chapters 7 through 12, Daniel's having the dreams and angels are interpreting. Does that make sense? Yeah. And he's actually, he's actually having these dreams during that chronological six chapter layout of things and so um as we go along we see that for instance what happens here in chapter seven uh does anybody know uh when this dream that he had in chapter seven when did it occur chronologically <laughs> so colleen's zipping in year 553. first year uh, of belshazzar's king of babylon yes yeah, so the first year of belshazzar as the king of babylon and so you see that it, uh, Daniel 7 actually sort of backs up and gives some insight as to when that is. And so this chapter 7 would fit in where in relationship to uh, uh, the first six chapters of Daniel? Well, it's likely close to 70 again. Yeah, somewhere between the fourth and fifth chapter right there. Yeah, because the fifth chapter picks up right at the end of Belshazzar's life, right, right at the end of it. Mm -hmm. So it's somewhere right around there. And so it's, it's sort of useful to, uh, you know, look at these things and see what's going on. Uh, so anyway, you have this dream, uh, you have this vision, and it's often referred to as the four beast dream. We'll get a lot more into it as to what all is meant by this and what's occurring in this. Uh, what is chapter 8 about? Tell me, when does chapter 8 occur? Daniel actually gives us the timelines on these things. In the third year of Belshazzar's reign. Yeah. Okay. So you see the same type of thing. He has one thing that happens right here. He has another thing that happens in Daniel chapter 8. Um, what's going on in Daniel chapter 8? Ah, Colleen's got it down in the chat. The ram and goat vision. The ram and goat. Uh, who had this vision? Daniel. Mm-hmm. Did he have any understanding of it? Not before Gabriel came and explained it to him. Yeah, that's it. He didn't know what it meant, but then Gabriel came, and Gabriel gave him a good bit of information about this. Okay, so it tells him the, the meaning of the vision. Uh, you know that it started; it's not quite complete. Um, what? Well, let me deal with this. He actually tells him what uh, countries, what kingdoms are represented by the animals. So uh, the ram was a picture of who? The ram or the me? No. Was Greece? No, the, the ram represented the Medo-Persian Empire, the Median Okay, Medo-Persian, yeah, there were two. Yeah. And then the goat represented who? Greece. Greece, right, the kingdom of Greece, exactly. And what's really uh, good about this, and pay real close attention to this as we go through these things, because folks, people really want to know the truth about this today. <laughs> people are always intrigued by prophecy. Uh, but even today, I, I've had an ongoing discussion with uh, Sabrina. A lot of y'all will know Sabrina for other classes, and uh, Aaron and a couple other folks. <clears throat> about what is happening with uh, uh, the Pope, you know, that the Pope has uh, decided to retire, which is a, a very unusual thing, as it happened for 600 years, and what that means. And then some people are talking about a prophecy that uh, uh, a, a, a Catholic priest, some, I can't remember if he was a Pope or not, I think he was a priest, a prophecy that was spoken some 708 years 
ago related to the uh, popes and all this kind of thing. People want to know about prophecy, but they equate one form of prophecy with another form of prophecy, a true prophecy with a false prophecy, et cetera, et cetera. And people are interested in this, but we must be able to speak forth the truth of the Lord, truth of his word, and give them understanding about why the word of the Lord is the truth. And a little thing like this right here is really helpful. Yeah, that's it, Aaron uh, uh, Malachi. It was the, the gentleman that said that he had a vision and that he'd received some information. Here, when we see that the ram represents the kings of Media and Persia, and that the goat represents the kingdom of Greece, God is showing us how to interpret certain things. When he speaks this truth through Gabriel, gives this interpretation to Daniel in chapter 8, that's going to help us understand some things later on in chapters 10 and 11. And so it's really helpful to be able to see these types of things. Uh, Colleen says, Greece, verse 22, uh, is where these people will come from. Uh, what does it say in verse 22? Would you believe I don't have it open right in front of me? What does it say there, Colleen? It says, the broken horn and the four horns that arose in its place represent four kingdoms which will arise from his nation, although not with his power. Yeah, so your question is what? It, I was just make, I just wanted to understand that the shaggy, it says the shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece, and that the large horn is in, is in between, but that the horn breaks, and then there's four horns that arise from it. Yes. Is that... And so that's going that, to be from Greece. That will be out of a Greece empire. Okay. Out of a Greece empire. Okay. Yeah, Greece empire. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. One of the things you really have to uh, resist uh, the temptation is to, is to try to apply modern day, current, contemporary uh, nation boundaries with what the Word of God is. You find out real quick that doesn't work. But what you do is you follow people groups. You follow groups that you see within the scripture. Uh, Karen says something here. Could you summarize what you said about the Pope and what we were studying? Uh, the whole summary of that is, is that people are curious about prophecy. They know that something's happening. They know that something is, is going on. They know that the Bible says something about days yet ahead. But they also know there's a lot of people that they just say what they want to, and they want to know what the truth is. Okay? They want to know the truth is. And so when you have a major uh, leadership of people like you're having right now within the Catholic Church, and then when you look at Catholicism, they really give a lot of heed to uh, certain types of prophecies uh, that are not within the Scripture. People want to know what the truth is, and we need to guide them to the Word of God. Uh, yeah, those uh, overlaid time period things are great there, uh, Colleen, that Karen's talking about. Yeah, it just happened this morning, uh, Colleen. It was just announced this morning that he's going to retire at the end of this month, uh, which is very rare. I think the last time the Pope retired was early 1400s, something like that. And uh, so anyway, keep your eye on what's going on there. There's some really uh, interesting things that will happen. Now, chapter 9 of Daniel. Tell me what's going on with this chapter. Well, Daniel was praying a prayer of repentance for the whole nation of Israel, I believe. Yes, and yes. And would restore Jerusalem back to its former glory. This is, if you want to know how to pray for your nation, uh -huh. whatever, wherever you are, this right here is the example. And uh, a phenomenal, phenomenal thing. When did this occur? First year of Darius's reign. In the first year of Darius, or Darius, however you want to say it, Darius, I, think both ways yeah. Are, yeah, I think both ways are proper. I, I say Darius because of where I live, and it just makes Karen so excited for me to say <laughs> it that way. I live close to there, too. <laughs> yeah, aren't, aren't you blessed? I tell you. And, uh, so anyway, but, it's only is, when, but it's only when you say it, Dale. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> So this will happen uh, right after the, uh, the fifth chapter of Daniel from a chronological point of view. And, yeah, you're right, Karen, to see how these things are taking place so rapidly. Um, we live in such a special time uh, within the lifetime of all of us uh, to see things that people have longed for hundreds of years to see, okay, or hundreds of years to see. And we're actually seeing them fulfilled. And so uh, – Anyway, you see this tremendous prayer that Daniel prays, and we'll spend a lot of time on this in part two. 
Uh, can you tell me what the result was of this prayer? Uh, somebody's waving at me. Yes, Karen. I think what's interesting, while we have history, his story, we can look back and see this and that, but it is, it's interesting, in their time, it wasn't going bam, bam, bam. Do you know what I mean? There were years in between these events. Sure, sure, yeah. Huge years sometimes. And uh, some of the things that were prophesied within the scripture, uh, I mean, you're talking, um, well, for instance, uh, the fact that uh, Israel would be a nation again, okay? That Israel would be a nation and be brought back uh, to their land as a people. Uh, that took hundreds and really thousands of years to take place. But we live in the time when that's occurred, 1948. I just, well, the reason why I brought that up is, you know, since we are a forgetful people, mankind is a forgetful people, it's interesting, you know, these events are happening and they're not like, all in a week. Um, wonder how much they were remembering. Who's they? The people. Um, well, the people in the court. You know, the king. Like how repent repentant they were. Yeah. yeah. Just, just to think this through, and you know, and be mindful or humbled by any of it. And yeah, it's so easy to forget. Yeah, you got a curious thing going on right here. Uh, Colleen answered my question. I was a little confused. I thought, what question? And I went, oh, yeah. The question I asked was, what was the outcome of Daniel's prayer? Well, the outcome of Daniel's prayer was that Gabriel appeared to him and spoke to him in about four verses or so. And what did he tell him in those four or five verses right there? What did Gabriel reveal to Daniel at the end of the ninth chapter of Daniel? That. That, uh, that Israel is going to go into captivity and that um, the uh, Jerusalem is going to be cut off from the Messiah and um, that eventually, after all, everything is done according to God's will, um, he's going to... Um, there's going to be someone that's going to come into, not not before God's will, but during all this, after Israel's cut off, there's going to be someone that's going to come and set themselves up in the temple. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so how could you put how could you put all that together in one nice little phrase? I put it that God is a God of restoration. God of restoration. Very good. He's going to destroy, he's, he's going to destroy Israel. He's going to destroy everything that that Daniel uh, that Daniel grew up with. Right. Everything's going to be destroyed. Think you know what he basically does? Crazy. Yeah. Karen wants to know: Isn't this where a lot of different es eschatologies come from? A lot of different understandings. Uh, oh yeah, this is one of the basic places that people uh, uh, interpret, misinterpret, ignore, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, generally speaking, Daniel, Gabriel tells Daniel, here, this is what's going on. The entire history of the balance of time of Israel is described right here, okay, of his people and of his city. You know, here's what's going to happen in the future. He's telling the future of his people. <clears throat> He's telling the future of the city, what's going to occur. <clears throat> Tell me, uh, from, what was Daniel's reaction to these visions? This one right here and the one that he had earlier up in, uh, um, I think, Chapter 7, in Chapter 8. They made him, chapter, they yeah, made about him the visions. weak. Yeah, they made him weak. They alarmed him. Weak, and uh, yeah, I'm scared. He didn't know what was going on. <laughs> yeah, sick and exalted. Yeah, <laughs> Rachel says an ultra summary. Is that what that was? It talks about the future, guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, it made him sick to the stomach and had a really, I mean, had a physiological impact on him. It really did. And we're going to learn so much in that ninth chapter right there. So much. Yeah, who wouldn't know oh, that? Uh, so tell me, what happens in the tenth chapter of Daniel? This is as far as First I First of all, tell me when this happens. <laughs> this is as far as you got, so you're bailing out now, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so what year did this take place in the 10th chapter? 
Oh, Aaron calls it the Tiger's Vision. I like that. I hadn't thought of that. Third year of Cyrus, King of Persia. Yeah. So obviously we're going to be putting sort of a sequence together of these kings where we see what's going on right here. And so it's a couple of years at, really after Daniel 9, all these things right there. And so what, what does he see here in this vision? sees three individuals, correct? Yeah, you start seeing some things right here. Let me ask you this. Uh, is there a relationship between what's going on in Daniel 10 and Daniel 11? Isn't he in the same vision as in chapter 10? Absolutely. Yes. And quite often people miss that. They come along and try to understand what's going on here. And they don't realize that really what's happening here in chapter 10 flows all the way through 10, 11, and even in the 12 there. Mega, that's really probably the best way what Meg described it as. Great conflict is what he sees. It's a vision of great, great conflict. And so we'll see what happens here as the man that's dressed in linen, remember that, gives him understanding about stuff. Uh, Karen says something here. This is an interesting that Daniel alone saw the visions. But the men who were with him had great terror that fell upon them and fled. Uh, yeah, he saw it, but they had terror. Why did terror come upon him? Something probably happened. You see that kind of thing occurring even at Jesus' at baptism? Yeah, Karen. I just think it's interesting. You know, I probably have never noticed that before, that he's the one that sees it, and um, the men around him who did not see it felt the weight of it, the, you know, the the, um, uh, the terror of it. Yeah, they knew something happened. They knew something was going on, whether it's like you see in other portions of the Scripture that – Somebody would hear the voice of God. Other people hear thunder, you know, that kind of thing. They knew something was up. They took off. They fled. Do you remember how Daniel is referred to here in uh, the 10th chapter? No, maybe in the spirit realm, maybe in the physical. Go ahead. I'm sorry. What was it? Was that where he was called the Prince of Man? Uh, no, not Daniel. Okay. He's called the man of high esteem. High esteem. I think yes. what uh, several of the translations call it. Yeah. A man of high esteem he's referred to in that way. So tell me, uh, uh, give me a good short synopsis of chapter 11. And don't use the word confusing. Rachel says explanation of the future. Yes. We'll talk about that in a second. Absolutely. Anyone else? North and south. What about the north and south, Aaron? Yeah, the colliding. That. That's what I would say. Kings of the north, kings of the south. Uh, uh, Colleen says Persia, Greece, back to ghosts. Yeah. You have this long chapter where the, you have an explanation. He's being told exactly what's going to happen. And from Daniel's perspective, it's just like what Rachel said. From the time when Daniel received this and under, you know, understood what he understood at that time, it was all going to be future. It was all in the future. Is it all in the future now, or do we know? We, we can look back and see that, that these things we were talking about have happened already to, to an extent. So it's, it's somewhat of the future. For Daniel, it was the future. And, and for Daniel that he was seeing, yes, I think that, yes, it has happened. But we also, God's word is continuous, so he also is speaking to us. 
Yeah. And Paul does the same thing in, in, in our time. Things that are to be have not come to pass. Some yes. Very good. Very good. Anyone else? Hey, Peggy, I'm going to mute you here for a second, okay? Okay. Okay, great. There we go. Anyone else? These things have been and are being. Yeah. What we're going to find, and uh, we don't know yet, okay, just in our study and our brief overview. Yes, Karen. I just think it's interesting that one of the things in our educational system um, and media, they want to rewrite history. There's been the destruction of words as well. And so if we don't know his story, it's um, harder to be able to take scripture and watch what plays out. Um, and we always got the football coach who taught history, did we not? Yes. Yep. Yep. And um, and you don't want to get me started on that because so much of what we consider to be truth and consider to be history uh, is not true. Let me use you, Karen. Can I use you as an example? Uh, you got some money, and I'll give you, and I'll put a bill to you. Okay. Sure. I'll tell you what. Next time we get together, <laughs> I'll buy. Next time you come to Alabama, I'll buy you some barbecue. Uh, oh, good. There okay, you, go. you could use me. Okay, tell me, who's the first president of the United States? Well, we think it's George Washington. Why? Do you smell a trap here or something? What do you mean we think? I know you're trying to trap me. <laughs> so you're saying Washington wasn't the first president? See, I, I know that story, and for the life of me, see, if you don't repeat it and practice it, you forget it. <laughs> well, my favorite covenant son down here is giving you a hint. Uh, Washington wasn't the first president. I think he was the 16th, the 15th or 16th president, because we had presidents under the Articles of Confederation, okay, as a nation. And it's just a simple historical fact. But everybody will say, oh, yeah, yeah, but everybody knows that Washington was the first president. Well, yes, but he really wasn't, okay? He really wasn't. And there's so, so many things related to history like that of what we think the truth is. Uh, it, you know, if I sit there and ask somebody, uh, uh, you know, the Gettysburg Address, isn't that where Lincoln set slaves free and all this kind of stuff? Uh, but that didn't really truly happen either. You know, when you read certain things, it's amazing because history gets perverted by man, and truly history is written by the victors, no doubt. And that's the reason it's so important to see the truths in this thing because uh, that's where Karen used to live, yeah. Uh, what we see here is that a portion of this 11th chapter of Daniel, and we're getting a little ahead, but I'll tell you, has been fulfilled, but there's a portion that hasn't. And we have been so blessed because we can look back and see how it was fulfilled, and we'll look at that in our studies down the road. But we can, it really strengthens our faith, I think. It really does, because then we know that yet that which is yet to come will be fulfilled. So, uh, in the uh, 11th chapter, you see some really curious things. Uh, Persia and Greece are mentioned in this thing. Uh, some other terms are mentioned. Uh, uh, Holy Covenant of the Sanctuary, uh, Abomination of Desolation. Okay. Uh, oh, Aaron, they shoot that rabbit. He's running. I just came out of the hole here, Aaron. Thank you. And uh, there's actually a mention made of a, a beautiful land, Holy Mountain. Those things are mentioned several times. So anyway, we'll pay close attention to that, but it's so applicable to, uh, uh, I think, our time. So lastly, uh, Daniel, chapter 12. Uh, tell me what's going on in this chapter right here. <laughs> Shoot that rabbit. What am I going to do with you, man? <laughs> Daniel 12, what's happening? Boy, everybody got real quiet. Did I turn y'all all off? Let me turn Peggy back on. I forgot I had to mute it for a moment. There you are, Peggy. Uh, well, I've gotten, gotten as far as I got to get caught up in my homework. So. Okay. Uh, uh, Aaron says, time, time and a half, prophecy, the end, new heaven and new earth. Yeah, yeah. Very, very good. Uh, you see this 
Daniel chapter 10, he had this vision of great conflict. Chapter 12, he's still by the river, and he's still hearing from that man in linen. Okay, so it's sort of Meg says something that Michael stands guard. Meg, can you tell me what, what you mean by that? I'm not sure if Meg has audio tonight or not. No. Yeah, that's sort of interesting. What is Michael standing guard over? And Eric, Karen was not. how in the world do some say no new heaven, new earth, no doubt. Uh, I tell you what, it's going to be really, 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 did I say really? Very, <laughs> really extraordinarily important for us to understand Michael out there. Colleen says Michael is the angel of Israel. What do you mean by that, Colleen? Well, in verse 1, it says he's the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people. So Daniel's people would be Israel. Right. So that just, since, he's, he, since Michael is the great prince who stands on guard, he's, 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 he's dedicated to Israel. He's the angel that's watching over Israel. Right. And so you, hang with me here. You're absolutely right. In that first verse, it says that he, is, that he stands guard over Israel. That's what he does. Okay. Then what does it say he's going to do? He's going to seal up the book until the time of the end. No, that's Daniel at the very end. What does it say at the beginning of that 12th chapter that Michael's going to do? I'm sorry. I should have made that clear. It says that he stands guard over Israel. He's going to, he's going to, rescue, he's going to rescue all the people who found written in the book. Does it say he's going to rescue? What does it say? Says everyone who was found written in the book will be rescued. Oh, back up further. Oh, Aaron's got it right there. It says that he will arise. That he will arise. And then you have the stuff. Yeah, Colleen, you were just talking about. Uh, Aaron wants to know, arise for what? And I'm not going to tell you right now. <laughs> I will pull it. Karen. But I'm telling you, did I mention that that's really important? I mean, it's just really, really important. Uh, no, this is not a rabbit. Uh, this is foundational, Aaron, to understanding uh, really, uh, really end-time eschatology. I mean, it's that that uh, insightful, that understanding, that one little thing right there. And uh, because that, where it has that little phrase that says, now at that time in Daniel chapter 12, well, at what time? Well, it's at the time of the end of Daniel 11. That whole phrase is going to, so it says, Michael the Prince stands guard over Daniel's people. I'll give you a hint while we go. That doesn't mean that at that time he will start standing guard. No, 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 no. That's what Michael does. Okay? Yeah, did I just clue you into something you weren't sure about there, Colleen, huh? It's, uh, uh, I tell you what, if you're... If, but we're yeah. not going to hit it until later, I believe. So. I was about to say, we're not going to hit it for probably about another 18 weeks. And... <laughs> So uh, if you want to, you know where my email address is, and you can catch me offline because I will rant and rave and rejoice over this all the time. Yeah, Karen? Wasn't that a commercial for part two? That's a pretty heavy hint, yeah. <laughs> no doubt. So uh, seriously, uh, just catch me uh, somewhere else offline, send me an email, whatever, and I'll tell you. So that really, really is important. And it's really great because... But this chapter, after all these uh, wars, these battles, these fights, this kind of stuff, Daniel actually comes before God and say, says, God, what, what does all this mean right here? What was God's response to him? Yeah, Colleen says rest. He basically says this. Here's what's going to happen, Daniel. You're going to die. Okay? You're going to die. You're going to rest with your fathers. And you're going to die. And in the last days, you will rise again to your reward, basically. Uh, you also see that phrase, abomination of desolation, mentioned again. Do you see it, uh, abomination of desolation mentioned anywhere else in the Bible? Yeah, in the New Testament. Yeah, over in the New Testament in Matthew. Where in Matthew? I'm not necessarily Ooh. interested in the, ch the chapter of verse. Oh, it is 24, yeah. And who, who's talking about it? 
Jesus is. You better believe it. Because the disciples had a, uh, two questions. <clears throat> when will these things occur? And what will be the sign of your coming again and of the end of the age? And Jesus launched this for two chapters. And from uh, Matthew 24, is it verses 4 through 14, he gives them a huge panoramic synopsis of what's going to happen. And in chapter 15, I believe, of Matthew 24 right there, he says, And so when you see the abomination spoken of by the prophet Daniel, and then the writer puts in that little parenthetical statement, let the reader understand. And then Jesus tells him what to do. Jesus is referring to this. That right there so solidifies the truth of the word of God in so many ways. It solidifies the truth that Daniel is a prophet. I got news for you. Most seminaries today do not teach that Daniel is a prophet. They teach that he was a great, wonderful guy and all this kind of stuff. But they don't believe that this was written uh, at the time it was written. They think it was written much later and that these were not prophecies, that these are historical accounts. That's totally wrong. Because Jesus himself said that Daniel was a prophet. Okay? And so anyway, we'll talk more about that as we get along. So Daniel's told to do something with this book. Colleen, I think you said it a while ago, but uh, what, what, what did God tell him to do with this book that he'd written down? To seal it up. Seal, it up. seal the words until when? Until the end time. Until the end of time. To the end of time. Uh, and uh, let me just tell you what I think about this, okay? I think that we're living in that end of time to where the book of Daniel uh, has been opened. If you go look at somebody like a Matthew Henry, I know a lot of us are familiar with Matthew Henry commentaries. Matthew Henry would write 500 pages on the smallest book. He wrote very little on Daniel. Many, many, many of the great writers from three or 400 years ago wrote very little. As a matter of fact, many of the great preachers and writers of even a hundred years ago really did not write much. I think it's literally been in the days since Israel has been brought back to their land that the words of the book had started being open into the heart of the people of the Lord. I think we really live in the last days when we see this stuff. Uh, the Lord ends this book in sort of a curious way. Did you see anything curious about the way that he ended it? What what were the last verse? What was the last verse about? He, he talks about him being blessed. Who's going to be really blessed? He who keeps, the, he who keeps waiting. Until when? And, uh, until until um, the end. Who who keeps the days. Yeah, he actually throws some numbers out there. He said, blessed is the one that makes it to 1,290 days. And how really, really blessed are those that make it to 1,335 days. Can anybody other than my son-in-law tell me what that might be about? <laughs> <laughs> Aaron and I talk about such things. Isn't that the uh, the time when there's the, the uh, tribulation? 90 to 35, isn't that going to be the time of the great tribulation, I should say? Not, not oh. Oh, and I hope you all write these questions down, these statements down, because we're going to discover so much. Is it? What else? Anybody else have any ideas about that 12, 90, 13, 35? Well, the 1290 days was like the three and a half years. And so then, I've studied Revelation. It's been a few years, so I can't remember the difference then between the days and <laughs> why that was. Actually, Actually, the three and a half years is 1,260 days. Okay. And that's really important because that's, you know, time times half the time, uh, three and a half years, 1,260 days, 42 months. They all are speaking of that period right there. But you have 1,260 days. Now you have the 1,290, and then you have the 1,335. So that would I, be... Time of, of peace reign, then if 1260 to 90 is the great tribulation, then 90 to 1335 is going to be when the, the world has peace and Jesus is reigning, wouldn't it? Uh, no, no, <laughs> <laughs> I decided, I, I decided since you asked me a very directed question, I'd give you a directed answer. How's that? Thank you. I need to study. You are going to learn so much. Uh, well, re really, you're, you're going to get your whistle wetted right here out of Daniel. And then you, you, you'll probably be able to twist my arm very, very easily, and I'll give you more than you than I should, related to a lot. Because people want to know about this kind of stuff. I mean, they want to know what the meaning of this is. 
So uh, anyway, this, uh, uh, Karen, to your private question, yes. Uh, this is, uh, these dates are really, really important. And uh, as well as uh, everything else, but some of these things just really help with understanding what's going to happen. Uh, eight years to what, Aaron? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron wants up it's going to take eight years for me to get to it because that's how long I've been talking with him about this stuff. I, no, no, no. <laughs> we'll be we'll be able to do it quicker than that. And and honestly, we'll be we'll answer. I will. I'll answer a lot of directed uh, questions because people want to know. And Colleen, you're right. There's tons of books out there, but I tell you what, I really think it's time for us as the as uh, believers in the Most High God and those who are in his word to be able to sit there and say, okay, here's where this is. This is what this is. This, this is what this is. Just like, uh, who was it while ago that said that you studied Revelation? Uh, a lot of us have studied Revelation, have read this, have read that. Well, let's pull some things together right here, okay, and see what it's saying about this. Whew. So anyway, our time's about up. Does anybody have anything you'd like to share, you'd like to say, or any questions that you would like to have unanswered right now? Uh, <laughs> anything like that. I think one of the most important things while we're studying this book, while all of us want to know, we're drawn to the tabloids at the checkout chance, uh, um, checkout at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. You know, the latest and the you know and the oh, the fortune tellers, all that kind of thing. We want to know, and that. But I think the one thing to remember, at least for me is to remember more why we have this book, not so much of when it's exactly going to happen, but why we have it. Right, right, right. And I, I really think it's, it's God's way of, uh, of drawing mankind to him. I mean, we'll look more about those kind of things later. Well, in the meantime, y'all make sure that you dive in the next week's lesson because we back up, we start at Chapter 1. And we start examining the details and things, okay? So uh, uh, let's pray together. Hey, uh, Peggy, would you mind praying for us? Are you still there as we depart tonight? Peggy or Becky? Yeah, Peggy. I think Peggy's still on here. I am, but I thought you said Okay, Peggy. great, great. No, no, okay. no, just, right. just you. Uh, thank you. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time we've had to open your word to discuss it together now, Father and the time that you've blessed us as we've done the study. And Lord, we just ask you to continue to give us time to make that time efficient and to help us when we open your word, Father, to, to glean from it what you would have us to glean. Father, we thank you for our, for our leader here that's leading us through this discussion. Give him insight and wisdom as he does that. And Father, just help us to uh, abide by what we learn from you. Bless each one that's listening to this uh, audio or however they're linked into this class today. These things we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Bless y'all. We'll see you again next time, okay? Bye -bye. Or hear you. <laughs> or hear you, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye.